Good evening, friends. This is Dr. Rajkumar. On behalf of Vadodara Psychiatric Society, I welcome you all on this ECME, Brain on Wednesdays. And the topic today is new treatment paradigm of positive symptoms, the apparent resistant cases, as well as what we are missing in all cases. To throw light on this and navigate our way through, I call upon Bhaskar. We all know him. Bhaskar, the platform is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, sorry for the initial hiccup, but as people say, ये छोटा छोटा इशू रहता ही है बड़ी बड़ी देश में सो लेट्स गो ऑन विद द मीटिंग फर्स्ट इन दिस टॉक आई वुड स्लोली अबाउट व्हाट वी डिस्कस्ड इन द गो फॉरवर्ड एंड वी वुड गो फॉरवर्ड इनटू रियल पैथोलॉजी रियल action of medicines and then if there is time we would go into some specific questions or the specific questions would be for next day the specific questions are is clozapine the original drug and the exact drug the specific question would be how justified is to actually trust on observation of a 40 year old trial then would come is there any molecule that can be called the best molecule or it would always be a combination and other thing but this would be the last part because first we need to navigate and need to understand once we understand we can actually create our own regime so with this let's start the whole thing i am scaring my skin and i would just stop my video that would make it easier to navigate so this is today's topic treatment of positive symptoms based on molecular psychopharmacology antipsychotic clozapine and the dopamine hypothesis they would be questioned today but first a slight revision and what last episode means this was what we understand understood in last episode that delusion is formed by increased autobiographical processes high extended motivational or reward circuit tone and decreased inhibitory control and decreased executive function these three combine to form fixed firm belief not amenable to logical reasoning and delusion but each of them in isolation produces three other effect increased autobiographical processes lead to rumination and obsession high extended motivational or reward circuit tone leads to compulsive and impulsive behavior decreased inhibitory control and decreased executive function leads to attention deficit trait and addiction to process and substances so this is the disorder of autobiographical processes there comes this is the network actually a network that extends from insula to temporo parietal junction to antero medial prefrontal cortex to premotor cortex to posterior and posterior cingulate cortex and various other area this is the network for rumination and obsession now these are us of extended or extended reward or motivation circuit this leads to compulsive and impulsive behavior this is a large network that 
सार्किट which actually is a flexible hub between motor network auditory network visual network and it is known as variously by nine names amongst which five actually are existing and four are not so so this is a another large circuit which gives rise to attention deficit state addiction to process and substance and the now comes the inhibitory control inhibitory control is combined motor and cognitive circuit which starts in various areas of cerebellum includes dentate nucleus thalamus motor cortex supplementary motor cortex premotor cortex then prefrontal cortex and ultimately create or possibly the largest brain circuit which inhibit the motor action as well as behavioral action as well as cognitive thing part and this disorder of this circuit leads to attention deficit state addiction to process and substances so this are the la three large network which gives rise to delusion in totality and in isolation rumination attention deficit and compulsive impulsive behavior and various addictions now this is the flow chart of hallucination formation all delusion forming machinery plus disturbed sensory discrimination network disturbed sensory integration network this uh, resulting in disturbed spatial perception and orientation giving rise to hallucinations of all sensory modalities though auditory is primary because auditory is less amenable to cross checks and balance now the sensory integration network is a large network which would involve all the sensory input channels plus thalamus plus hippocampus plus cerebellum Plus various areas of cerebral cortex. We don't know the exact pathways of cerebral cortex that give rise to sensory integration. But this type of sensory integration network gives rise to two things. One is this type of spatial perception and orientation. But the other thing is sensory processing disorder and. you know sensory processing disorder as something that is common in autism spectrum symptom so this is where psychosis and autism spectrum disorder merge and this is how actually more and more patients whom we diagnose as treatment resistant schizophrenia and blah 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 they are actually high functioning autism or autism spectrum who are ultimately developing the full disorders of sensory integration and ultimately producing psychosis in the initial stages there are sensory modulation disorder sensory base motor disorder sensory discrimination disorder anyone who is in touch with psychiatric child psychiatry knows this name by heart and i am not going into the details of this now disorders of sensory discrimination network sensory discrimination is again a huge network which has various arms in cerebellum then all the special senses then posterior parietal cortex then primary motor area premotor area supplementary motor area then thalamus then hippocampus then superior calculus then that goes into various parts of temporal cortex and 
dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, ventral medial cortex. This gives rise to this uh, disturb uh, when they are disturbed, they, they, they give rise to disturb sensory integration network, which causes disturbs special passive perception and hallucination on one side and other side is again sensory processing disorder. This child of autism who has sensory processing disorder may very well grow to be so-called treatment resistant schizophrenia of tomorrow and the people who are never going to go in past history of the patient or childhood history of the patient or birth history of the patient would never be able to find the hidden high functioning autism symptom. So the, we so far discussed about connectomics formula. The connectomic pathophysiology of psychosis it gave us various ideas, it gave us various insights. But does knowing this connectomic formula give any help in psychopharmacology? No. Connectomic knowledge is for something else. It is not for psychopharmacology. Because knowing this electrical grid would not tell us how the electrical grid is being formed, how the electrical grid is being disturbed molecular way, and how the specific hubs and nodes produces specific macro level functions and dysfunction. Drugs are non-specific. Actually, this is blessed way in, in mo most of the ways and cursed in occasional way. Why it is blessed? Because drugs do not consider it is only problem of brain. Drugs consider it is problem of whole organism. So they treat the whole organism. They don't focus on brain and lose the other areas that give rise to better care, better care. And Problem of drugs is they are non-specific, so they are not expected to work on us one specific thing. They would work as a whole. They work at molecular levels, affecting brain-wide function and systemic function all over our bodies. So what was the point of last time's discussion? Because this last 15 minutes and one and a half hours of last discussion was on only connectomics. So why we did that if that has no help in Psychopharmacology. Here we actually learned the connectomics pathology behind the real phenomena that we see in our day to day clinical practice. And now we don't have to give patients imaginary psychological formula. We can directly say that look, your executive system is uh, control is not working. So you are having this kind of hallucination, or we can give the uh, family explanation that look, the motivational circuit is working over time, and that is why, in addition to the psychosis, there is also impulsive compulsive behavior, and the passion is going into drinking and other things. We can also do various back calculation, for example we can understand that why alcoholic hallucinations occur. Because alcoholism is actually one of the expressions of impulsive compulsive behavior. And 
during chronic alcohol withdrawal what would happen is the executive circuits would go down the inhibitory control would go down and that would give rise to excessive visual and auditory imagery and ultimately that would come as hallucination so we can get understanding of various phenomenology through the connectomics formula we might not be able to predict the treatment through connectomics formula specifically the pharmacological treatment but we can get the clear conceptual explanation for a lot of things that we see in our day to day clinical practice and we actually got new and novel targets of electrical magnetic ultrasonic and infrared radiation stimulation of various brain symptoms in this discussion including new indication and actually those who are interested in neuromodulation they would find following few slides very interesting what novel areas we got insular cortex for sensory processing disorder insular cortex for somatic symptom insular cortex for various forms of impulsive compulsive problem specifically that concerns various bodily symptoms temporoparietal junction posterior cingulate cortex medial prefrontal cortex medial prefrontal cortex is not so novel but the use of medial prefrontal cortex in this way is novel temporal pole various areas of cerebellum which is now getting prominence posterior parietal cortex this would be the novel areas where we can give a tms we can give deep tms insular cortex is better accessed by deep tms MS, posterior cingulate cortex by deep TMS, medial prefrontal cortex by either deep TMS or normal RTMS, cerebellum areas, some areas would be amenable to deep TMS, some areas would be amenable to RTMS, posterior parietal cortex better to be given by deep TMS, and a novel indication, nobody has told that autism spectrum symptoms would be amenable to the various neuromodulation attention deficit symptoms would be amenable to various neuromodulation impulsive compulsive symptoms would be amenable to neuromodulation negative symptoms would be amenable to neuromodulation executive functioning failure in various so called neurodegenerative disorders would also be Actually, I am able to various neuromodulation, and in neurorehabilitation process, we use neuromodulation mostly on aphasia. But with this understanding, we can see that neurorehabilitation process needs a lot of neuromodulation in various areas of brain for. revival of various sensory and motor deficits so the question what we did in today's 20 to 30, 25 minutes and last times one and a half hours we actually learned useful pathological explanation pathophysiological explanation and we learned what to give various neuromodulation in various brain dysfunctions and that is where our conceptions come handy now what about medication because most if not all are psychopharmacologists first and in uh, anything else later medications work at new molecular neurobiology molecular biology level and affect everything in cellular function all over body medications don't 
discriminate. So to know their actual action, we need to know the basics of molecular neuroscience of brain activity. Speaking of which, brain is not an alphabet soup filled with seven letters. That is the biggest mistake psychiatry is doing for last 70 years. We talk about dopamine, serotonin, uh, glutamine or glutamate and noradrenaline, these monoamines. We, these four monoamines, then we talk about endopioid, endocannabinoid, that too recently, and we talk about GABA. That is the end of our neurotransmitter understanding. We forget that brain has close to 2,000 neurotransmitter, also known as cell-to-cell -cell transmission, who have their autocrine function, gastrocrine function, paracrine function, endocrine function. There is no scope for brain to have just seven neurotransmitters. All world view of psychiatry is through five and now seven neurotransmitters, which almost does everything in brain according to psychiatry. Then do not. So we need to readjust our reality. It's time we wake up to 2024 rather than in 1960. This is an example. See, dopamine transporter is mostly concentrated in basal ganglia. But if you look here, where is the pointer? Yes. If you look here, there is dopamine transporter. If you look here, there is some dopamine transmitter. If you look these areas, there are dopamine transmitter. Yes, this is the main concentration. But actually, dopamine transporter is distributed throughout the brain. Serotonin transporter, it is the whole brain, midbrain, and Basal ganglia has more concentration, but it is whole brain. Noradrenaline, same. So our this view of this neurotransmitter is working on this circuit only. This has to change. Every circuit has at least a thousand neurotransmitter. So our drugs don't work by neurotransmitter. Either that is the reality or our knowledge of brain so far is very wrong. Uh, either of these two realities is true. Either there is not 2000 neurotransmitter and either there is 2000 neurotransmitter and drugs don't work for neurotransmitter. These are the various molecular imaging that we have now that can show us various brain transmitters and none of them have proved that there is any serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline or various other dysfunction in schizophrenia, bipolar and things like that. This is just an example how molecular imaging can be used in a specific syndrome complex. This is the Parkinsonian syndrome. So the basic understanding of neuronal hyperexcitability needs to be done before we go into action of drugs because drugs are basically working via molecular pathway. So we need to understand molecular neurophysiology. So there would be a connectomic exploration for the symptom. Then there would be a molecular exploration of the symptom. Then we would come into drug. So let's talk about brain and its brief molecular mechanism to work. It is. It would be very brief because trust me, if I delve deep into it, it would lead to a seven day CME rather than a one and one, hour, one and a half hour lecture. So 
when there is any functional challenge to brain let's say someone develop a fever someone develop a uh, cardiomyopathy someone develop a respiratory infection someone develop some negative event in his or her surrounding environment and goes into grief everything is increased homeostatic load for brain and that means high information carrying load so there would be hyperactivity of the brain areas handling that load this would lead to increased cellular protein recycling increased mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation there would be redox stress and cellular stress from in increased mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation there would be ES stress response through cellular protein recycling and ultimately all of them would lead to cellular stress sensing by nod like receptor which is one type of pattern recognition receptor intracellular and resulting damage associated molecular pattern pathway activation this would lead to microglial activation by toll like receptor microglial activation would activate astrocyte uh, m1 m0 to m1 would lead to a0 to a1 but astrocyte would again then inhibit microglia via a1 so there would be a counterbalance and this counterbalance load if it it tilts towards microglia then the following events occur if it is tilts towards astrocyte then microglial activation will be suppressed there will be secretion of vasoactive peptide there will be endothelial activation of neuronal vessels and there will be neurovascular activity then through other pathway activation of nlrp3 nil chromosome in endothelial cell microglia would also cause neurovascular activity this would then produce give brain more and more blood supply and that would give us give brain more metabolic substrates now microglial activation would also give rise to modification of extracellular matrix and limited dissolution of perineural net perineural net is condensation of extracellular matrix around neurons so that neuron act do not go into spontaneous by the sinus sinus formation and spontaneous branching microglia would dissolution would cause dissolution of this net and there would be neuronal ability to develop new synapses then microglia would cause activation of neural proliferation zone which are subventricular zone as well as hippocampal proliferation zone here there are neuronal stem cell neuronal progenitor cell they would be activated and there would be neurogenesis and gliogenesis this new, new neuronal cell and glial cell would migrate to the zone of activity by active and passive neuronal migration new neuronal cell would settle down in zone of hyperactivity there would be synaptogenesis now after synaptogenesis there would be synaptic remodeling strengthening of active synapses and long term potentiation or pruning and long term depletion of inactive synapses that would lead to neuroplasticity and brain would adapt to homeostatic load this is the normal molecular pattern of brain's physiological activity when it is facing some uh, functional load sometimes the full pathway needs to be done sometimes only hyperactivity of brain areas leading to the load is enough depending on the functional load the whole pathway or just this thing if this is a physiology what would be the pathology each of these are actually this this these are actually books literally books can be written on them these are actually very detailed procedure we can write book on cellular protein recycling and misfolded protein response we can write book on 
redox stress and cellular stress. We can write book on my mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. So I would not go into detail of each process because that would bore you. And most of you are not pure researchers. It would go beyond you. So I would give example of two processes. Then we, I would again switch back to schematic. So neurophysiology, when it becomes neuropathology, there are various steps. There is one step of mitochondrial oxidation and redox activity. Mitochondria is the powerhouse of cell. In class 2 to class 8, we learned about eternal truths of life. And later, all the eternal truths that we learned during that time became false. Sun doesn't rise in, rise in the east, doesn't set in the west. It is probably the most blatant lie we have ever read. But mitochondria is powerhouse of cell. This is the eternal. And oxidative phosphorylation inside thousands of micro mitochondria of a single cell would create energy for each and every cell activity. That is also true. But there are millions and literally when we talk about intracellular dysfunctions, we are talking about millions. There is no less number in cell. A cell has about billions of processes. Cells have about various billions of protein. And so there would be Millions of different kind of dysfunction in any process of cell. So there are millions of causes of so-called psychosis too. And each cause has millions of variations. So there are different kind, millions of different kinds of mitochondrial dysfunction that can destroy this oxidative phosphorylation and produce either too much or too few energy. And both can disturb the cellular excitation process resulting in eventual Excited oxidity by disrupting cells, reactive oxygen species for production and reactive oxygen species handling. These are the different disorder of mitochondria and oxygen phosphorylation. Do not be fooled. Each disorder have millions of variation. Disorders of mitochondrial DNA function, disorders of mitochondrial function, disorders of nuclear DNA and mitochondrial DNA interaction, disorders of mitochondrial formation, disorders of mitochondrial fission, fusion, and disorders of microphagy, disorders of ROS production, disorders of ROS handling, disorders of ROS signaling. The list is almost endless if we just talk about mitochondria and ROS. Then there is increased protein recycling and intrinsically disordered protein. There are millions of protein who do not have a stable CD structure fully or partly. They are capable of performing magnitude of actions due to their this unique structure because they don't have a particular stable CD structure. So they can adapt to different forms and get attached to different stimuli and different receptors. And that gives rise to so versatility of their action. But this is also their weakness. Because whenever protein recycling increases, they become more and more unstable due to their lack of a stable 3D structure. And when their instability goes above a threshold level, they trigger activation of ubiquitin proteasome system. And their, their results are destruction of protein. When the destruction of protein is too much, there is disturbed cellular proteostasis. And that produces enteroplasmic reticulum stress, cellular stress, and ultimately cellular hyperexcitation. This is a schematic view of what are the intrinsically disordered proteins or what are various protein doesn't have full intrinsic disorder. Some of them has some part, some of them has short length, some of them has long length. And so this is a classification. If 
someday we get time i would like to talk about details in intrinsically disordered protein because they actually link psychiatry to oncology but not today i would just show some example you see you cannot un even understand how many dots are there each dot is a protein and the red dot which is in the middle which i am pointing out is a known protein for most of you it is p53 protein which is a tumor suppressor protein or immune surveillance protein or cellular surveillance protein whatever you are familiar with this protein has three names but this is a intrinsically disordered protein having one intrinsically disordered part and this gives rise to almost 1099 interaction just one intrinsically disordered protein here this is another protein you know it you heard about alpha synucleopathy alpha synuclein deposit in so called idiopathic parkinson parkinsonian disease this is that alpha synuclein it has a single this is the alpha synuclein protein and it it uh, this single protein interacts with more than 2000 proteins these are the two forms of the protein in as predicted by dpi alpha four and this regions are this this regions this regions this regions they have they, they don't have a stable td structure this is amyloid precursor protein the interaction is so much that you cannot see the original protein until and unless i press the pointer over it so this is amyloid precursor protein and it has more than 3000 interaction this is how interest interesting intrinsically disordered protein are and all our so called neuroregeneration are characterized by deposition of this intrinsically disordered disordered protein so each step would give you more details about molecular defects in brain and the rest of the body resulting in basic hyper excitability of the cell but detailing each is not the job assignment today if our if we someday get time i promise i would conduct a full 7 to 10 days cme physically for them but today is drugs and so let's cover this area via infographics all of these disturbances leads to cellular hyperactivity what are the disturbances mitochondrial dysfunction redox dysfunction intrinsically disordered protein dysfunction ubiquitin proteasome dysfunction aberrant mitochondrial activation aberrant exocyte activation abnormal inflammasome activation neurovascular unit dysfunction extracellular matrix protein dysfunction innate and adaptive immune system dysfunction coagulation system dysfunction all would give rise to cellular hyperactivity and cellular hyperactivity in turn would cause reduced neuronal migration reduced neuronal oh god i have actually uh made it twice this would be reduced neuronal maturation maturation is here migra migration this is originally migration and this is maturation then high coagulation system dysfunction and thrombophilia involvement of all cells of body gradually all other ncds would also increase and there would be reduced stem cell proliferation increased activity of neutrophil and neutrophilic extracellular tract formation leading to netosis neutrophilic cellular tract is actually when neutrophil gets excited they secrete their dna their cellular matter 
into their surrounding environment and create a trap where various bacterial or viral protein gets stuck. And then this net is phagocyte by mononuclear phagocytic system. But unfortunately, if neutrophils are hyperexcited, then they would secrete net indiscriminately and this net would cause widespread inflammation and give rise to various inflammatory problems. Ultimately, all of these would lead to loss of brain and body homeostatic adaptability. This is actually, I'm talking here, but this should be discussed in the series when we would talk about negative and cognitive symptoms. Cellular hypersecurity could also cause gradual loss of stem cell in neural perturbation zone. There will be gradual loss of synapses and loss of neural plasticity and brain plasticity. There will be increased chances of spontaneous depolarization and re entrance circuit formation. This would lead to seizure. This is the cause of seizure in progressive chronic psychosis or progressive chronic bipolar. Then there will be increased cellular aging and same sense as associated secretory phenotype giving rise to more and more inflammatory mediator. And this causes the premature aging that is seen in all the patients of high genetic load psychosis or bipolar. So I have given you some understanding of molecular pathophysiology of psychosis and mania combined. In one chapter, I would cover mania, molecular uh, uh, biology too, but it would be same or almost same as the psychosis because they are two faces of the same point. And various studies in the world today, starting from 2013, these SNPs, are proving that day by day. Although various problems in the real world is not letting these two faces unite. Anyway, so molecular psychopharmacology of drug, which could help here. First, let me make it clear there is no antipsychotic because. In the so far discussion, I have made it clear that there is no definitive disease like psychosis. So there cannot be any drug named antipsychotic. So then question comes, is there any common mechanism by which all drugs work on hallucination and delusion? Because for us, that is psychosis. So any common mechanism that would link hallucination and delusion would be acted on by drugs. And as a matter of fact, yes, there is common mechanism. We have already discussed them. But that is slightly different in delusions and hallucinations. Common mechanisms to be targeted for hallucination would be neuronal hyperexcitability, neuronal hyperactivity, then neuronal transmission, then neuronal hypermetabolism. If you think about it, then they are actually similar things given slightly different names. Because why slightly different name? Because in their core, something is different. Hyperactivity doesn't always lead to excitotoxicity. Excitotoxicity would depend on hyperactivity along with decrease neuronal reserve. Neuronal hyperactivity and neuronal excitotoxicity doesn't mean increased neuronal transmission. That would only happen if the <coughs> hyperactive and excitotoxicity suffering neuron is able to spread its hyperactivity and excitotoxicity to surrounding neurons. Neuronal hypermetabolism doesn't give rise to these things until and unless there is coupling between electrical activity and chemical activity. So 
although they seem like similar things, they are slightly different. So what are the drugs for neural hyperexcitability and hypermetabolism? And from here, all hell would break loose. Because from here, I am going against all so-called drug nomenclature. All the drugs previously known as antipsychotic, they are drugs for neural hyperexcitability and hypermetabolism. Most of them reduce mitochondrial function, reduce paracrine, endocrine, and dastatin activation of scale, reduce immune activation, and reduce cellular energy conversion. The, the caveat of their effectiveness lies in the degree of reduction of cellular function. If some critical level of functional impairment happens in cell, then that would in turn trigger cellular death pathways in the cell. And when cellular death pathway is triggered, there is violent severe excitation. And that might result in seizures. So chronic Psychosis and seizure can happen via the antipsychotics too, but only when they cross a certain physical level. Like in various other areas, we don't know what is that physical level. Now, all the drugs known as synthetolytics, specifically the central and gangrene acting ones, they would also be antipsychotic because they have properties that reduce cellular excitability, increase membrane stability, reduce neuronal metabolism, reduce inflammation. They also reduce immune response in cells. The example would be guanfacin. The example would be clonidine. Prajocin would come in distant third. Propranolol would come in same distant third. And if anyone is questioning, they can go to Google Scholar and search clonidine in mania. They would find some interesting documents of 1940s, 1950s, where it was actively used in mania. But somehow, nobody never ever tried to pursue that line. Why? Nobody knows. If you have bias against pharma lobby, then you would say it is pharma lobby conspiracy. If you have bias against psychiatrist, you would say psychiatrist have suppressed an effective uh, non-toxic molecule. If you have bias against psychologists and uh, various other people, then you would say psychologists conspired to kill that. We can create a lot of conspiracy theories, but nobody knows why an effective molecule group were suppressed. <laughs> then the caveat, what is the caveat of their use? The caveat of their use is the tendency to cause severe hypotension and orthotrophic hypertension in susceptible patients. All the drugs that reduced brain arousal system function are also associated with decreased cellular function, decreased cellular metabolism, and immune reactivity of the cell. Benzodiazepines, barbiturate, Z drug, melatonin, and Dora group of drugs fall here. Dora group of drugs associated, I have also associated specific neuronal transmission reduction. So Dora groups is more useful amongst all this, but the dose is high. Don't expect 5 mg or 10 mg to work here. Think about Lamborexant, 30 mg, Lamborexant, 40 mg, and things like that. Various antibiotics, depending on their mitochondrial inhibition activity, calcium and sodium channel blocker activity, ability to disturb endoplasmic reticulum and protein synthesis can also work as neuronal excitation inhibitor. If you remember, our quest of psychopharmacology started with anti-tubercular drug. And <clears throat> Ultimately, the, the circle is complete. All the available antibiotics in market, they can be repurposed as antipsychotic agents. Unfortunately, we don't know how much dose is required. 
we don't know how long to use and we don't know how many extracellular activity would be there how they would destroy the cellular uh, pathways in other areas how they would suppress the various other thing and how they would change the microbiome constituent of our body but you already know minocycline tetracycline doxycycline they have been used in psychosis you already know that linezolid a drug which is used in elderly is notorious for its brain activity and things like that then so called anti depressants which are paradoxically low grade immune system continuous stimulator and stimulator of neuronal metabolism work in hallucination by few different mechanisms so called anti depressants do not work via other drugs they are actually more like partial agonist of immune system partial agonist of neuronal metabolism so by working as partial agonist they stabilize the immune system and prevent sudden severe immune activation similarly by working as partial agonist they stabilize the neuronal metabolism and by that sudden metabolic spike do not happen and they also do not let the brain go into sudden this had brain not Uh, neurons they also do not let neuron to go to sudden metabolic stoppage and rebound excitatory they really work wonderfully on delusion and they also stop the aberrant imagery formation what is the caveat of their use in hallucination their caveat is we don't know how much excitotoxicity is going on in a patient when the patient is presenting acutely to us so if a patient patient is presenting with high level of excitotoxicity their partial agonist activation uh, action would take a long time to work it would take <coughs> weeks and possibly months so by that time all the damages would be done so ideal time of their use is once the antipsychotic is in place once the antipsychotic is working clearly then they should be employed to give the final respite and to bring the patient back to functional level now all selective estrogen receptor modulated drugs they are also working in the hallucination via virtue of their membrane stabilization their anti metabolism and their mitochondrial stabilization action all kinase inhibitor i am talking about kinase inhibitor means not only protein kinase inhibitor i am talking about genus kinase inhibitor i am talking about all kinase in all types of kinase inhibitor that are working in various autoimmune disease various cancers and various other kind of diseases so they would also work in various symptoms of hallucinations because they also reduce neuronal excitation they also reduce neuronal and cellular hypermetabolism they also reduce the mitochondrial hyperactivation so they can be used and protein kinase inhibitor that is endoxifen is already in use problem is we don't know about other kinase inhibitors those we don't know what specific or non specific off target effect would be there we don't know how long to give and various other things but 
they are definitely a good candidate for so called psychosis then pyrinergic medications they are also good because they reduce mitochondrial they reduce number one microglial activation number two they reduce the microglial shape change from <clears throat> m0 to m1 and from m2 to m1 they promote m2 form of micro microglia more which is more reparative than pro inflammatory then they also work in various neuronal membranes and increases neuronal stability in fact i don't know how many of you know but allopurinol was once tried for psychosis and mania and there are various case reports on it but again like every other experimental procedure we didn't know what was the dose what was the actual duration that needs to be that needs to be given and things like that so that exploration didn't go on for long but that is another pathway all immunokine inhibitor again interleukin 6 inhibitor then tnf alpha inhibitor interferon alpha inhibitor all immunokine inhibitors are also good but they need to be given in a combination cocktail we don't know the ideal composition of it there should be at least in uh, il6 inhibitor should be there but along with that possibly tnf alpha uh, needed tnf alpha inhibitor needed interleukin gamma inhibitor needed possibly interleukin 8 inhibitor and interleukin 2 inhibitor is also needed but this is currently just a speculation various uh, tries are going on to find combination uh, cocktail of monoclonal antibodies but no breakthrough yet then drugs for reducing neuronal transmission all so called anti epileptics along with lithium lithium actually also reduces neuronal metabolism and neuronal excitation if you understand so far discussion you would understand that these agents would inhibit cell to cell juxtacline activation which is electrical activation of neuron paracrine activation and endocrine activation which is chemical activation so by giving them we can actually reduce the aberrant imagery formation or hyperactive imagery formation which is at the core of hallucination what is the problem and, and caveat of their use lithium is initially immune stimulation followed by chronic long term immune depression so by that initial immune stimulation action it would not be able to prevent the hyper excitability very fast number one that is the problem with lithium with anti epileptic the problem is cognition dampening as they inhibit cellular transmission and as well as cellular excitation too they make the cognitive process very very slow for cognition we need multiple parallel processing of information and its integration if we give antileptic this process is hampered and that actually after a critical dose would hamper the executive circuitry the inhibitory circuitry and would ultimately produce rebound increase of hallucination that is the problem of anti epileptic the same problem that can happen with benzodiazepines and other because of their paradoxical excitation so if this is the common mechanism to target in 
hallucination then what are the common mechanism to target in delusion increasing ex executive control decreasing motivation circuit activation and increasing inhibitory control what are the drugs that can increase executive control number 1 atomoxetine but problem of atomoxetine is it would increase excitation to cellular excitation and so it is a double edged sword in some patients the delusion would respond but in many patient there would be increase activation so what other medications can be given the good example would be antidepressants antidepressants excel in increasing the executive control and antidepressant doesn't actually affect the neuronal excitation that much so if we progress slowly if we give antidepressants in slow progressive dose but we reach to the optimum dose we would be able to increase the executive control we would be able to increase the inhibitory control too and that would lead to very good result in delusion that is why antidepressants in adequate dose work very well on delusion so what is the adequate dose that we don't know but to be very i would say speculative yeah. we can say that that dose needs to be on the higher side although the increment would be slow because here we are counteracting rumination rumination is a basic brain behavior and to counteract rumination we need to go to that dose which would be able to override this natural brain process so we are talking about possibly so called ocd level drug ocd level dose but due to them being partial activator of neuronal metabolism and partial activator of immune system the dose increase should be slow so what other drugs can we give if we want to decrease motivational circuit activation then without damaging executive control or inhibitory control then also comes ecrm group of drug various kinase inhibitors and inhibitors of nibolar group ya to hello yes hello. please mute yourself and inhibitors and modulators of opioid system and alia ja cannabinoid cannabinoid system so kondo jara so probably we are looking at cannabidiol in future when it is accessible for patients probably we are looking at various opioid antagonists in future which would be actually applicable for the patients we should be actually affordable for the patients so you see we got an overview and don't mistake it for details because details means we are talking at a seven day physical cm an overview of all the molecular and anatomic pathophysiology of psychosis and their drugs i promised to talk about clozapine and whether it is a base drug or not but unfortunately i have already talked about more than 
one hour twenty minute, and today we would lose time for interaction. And if we go on, I promise I would discuss trisapine in this psychosis series either in next topic or next to next topic when we discuss about various cases. With this, I am ending this presentation today. Thank you, Dr. Baskar. All of you can unmute yourself. Dr. Malay, can you just take over the questions that have just come into the chat box? Uh, yeah, thank you, Baskar, for uh, detailed uh, 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 detailed presentation on uh, how we need to look at the positive symptoms of psychosis uh, uh, from a very basic perspective, from a very basic science perspective, that is the molecules and how uh, we can target them. We have got some uh, questions uh, and I'll read those out today to you. Is, today, there is very less question. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we'll see whatever whatever has come our way. We'll, uh, <clears throat> so, Dr. Ankur Singhal asks, which antidepressants have evidence for use in psychosis? Any, any uh, points on okay. that? Which antidepressants has evidence? Hmm. Uh, if almost all antidepressants has case reports as evidence. Case reports. Okay. They are, uh, we work in a guideline-based system where guideline says antidepressants are strictly contraindicated in psychosis. And antidepressants only comes when there is clozapine-resistant schizophrenia. Not even treatment-resistant schizophrenia. Only in psychotherapy resistant schizophrenia, we talk about <clears throat> mitazapine, fluoxetine, and things like that. So standing there, we cannot expect to get any evidence. Uh, fortunately, there are some case reports, but those who are conversant in evidence, they know that it is level 5 evidence. Okay. Uh, another question is, uh, Dr. Amit Sethi asks, uh, studies have also been done for negative symptoms and COX-2 inhibitors. So, uh, where do they stand yes. as of now? COX-2 inhibitors would be similar. They work in prostaglandin pathway. They work in lipoxygenase pathway. So, by working there, even not only uh, COX-2, all anti-prostaglandin and anti leukotrienes drugs can be given. They prostaglandins, prostaglandinoids, or ar arachnic acid metabolites, they are actually one of the important group of molecules which cause cellular excitation. If we block them, we are also reducing the chances of cellular excitation. Sadly, we don't know the dose. Sadly, we don't know the duration. And more than that, only prostaglandin inhibition probably is not effective. So that is why negative symptom trials have failed. Because negative symptoms are not due to excited oxidity. They are more like the deficit left behind by excited oxidity. Okay. Dr. Ritwik Chatterjee asks, uh, asks, you have explained about the drugs. But can you elaborate a bit on the mechanism of ECT on all the cellular processes? Role of ECT? ECT would be connect one modality that doesn't work on this cellular process. Like RTMS, like CDCS, like DBS. They, ECT work on whole brain-wide connectome basis. Brain has almost 33 known pacemakers till date. Maybe we would discover more, more in coming years. ECT actually causes re-adjustment of activation of these synapses, these uh, pacemakers. What would that do? That would create a stoppage of normal electrical brain rhythm followed by 
re initiation of the brain rhythm again like heart when we give dc cardioversion we expect the arrhythmia to abate and normal heart rhythm to ensure similarly in brain the abnormal electrical activity we expect it to abate and give rise to a stable activity unfortunately ect is not that good for psychosis because in psychosis the pacemakers are not in complete disarray they are more into deviant firing so most of the time they do not respond the type of symptom that respond to ecd are mostly symptoms of chaotic pacemaker activation akin to ventricular tachycardia the catatonia phase catatonia is the situation where ecd excels because like ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation or various tachyarrhythmias of ventricle catatonia is also a tachyarrhythmia of brain where there is chaotic reentrant circuit all over the brain so standing there giving ecg works wonderfully in catatonia but not so in here now if we talk about repeated ecg and repeated ecgs effect on this molecular and cellular process then the story would be different because by giving repeated ecg and we don't know how many repeated ecg would require for a given patient there would be change in excitation and urinary balance the inhibitory pathways would get a, get strengthened the various cellular signaling specifically not not jagged signaling emp uh, sorry uh, mapk signaling uh, various neuronal neuropeptide signaling they would be strengthened and that would lead to change in various neuronal stem cell and other area but we actually don't know how many ecgs are required for a particular patient to get this effect okay uh, we have a question from uh, dr nachiketa desai uh, won't decreasing the motivational circuit actually lead to negative symptoms if motivational circuit is hyper hypoactive and we are again decreasing it there will be negative symptom if the, the so called negative symptom rather if motivational circuit is hyperactive and there is extreme aggression violence uh, along with of a uh, good various form of hallucination then reducing the motivational circuit activity would give rise to calming of the patient and would give rise to various beneficial effect that is why actually antipsychotics injectable antipsychotics work so fast they fast reduce the motivational circuit activity okay um uh... Doctor Jadeja asked, "Which drugs increase uh, increase the inhibitory control?" Antidepressants definitely do. Uh, naltrexone possibly do. Uh, endoxifen do, but whether that is the only action that we don't know. Endoxifen and uh, various other kinases they work on various brain areas. So possibly one part is increasing inhibitory control, the other part. the motivational circuit suppression and other area other things okay uh, dr divay mangla asks uh, do anti long term antibiotics use lead to depression abhi bana ke rakh de baad mein kha lunga teen roti yes juice aayega juice lunga yes yes okay uh, there yes, are many there are evidences okay uh and dr uh, mangla also asked a few more questions which i'll take it right now since we are looking at his questions 
how do antipsychotics help in depression because uh, they are supposed to bring down neuronal activation uh, increase Anti inhibition hmm. so how do antipsychotics help in depression antipsychotics do not help in depression what antipsychotics helps in associated anxiety antipsychotics reduce brain's metabolism brain uh, neuronal metabolism antipsychotic reduce neuronal excitation what happens in depression one part is the motivational circuit is down the executive control is not much down or slightly down the inhibitory control is overactive now when we give antipsychotic the antipsychotic would lead to reduction of amygdala activity that reducing hypervigilance of anxiety would reduce the inhibitory uh, uh, control a bit uh, a bit and by doing that would give patient relief so that relief is by reducing hypervigilance by reducing inhibitory control but if we give antipsychotic more and more they would produce their own effect depression and there will be deficit syndrome of antipsychotic okay uh what okay so uh, some more of his questions are how do antipsychotics uh, help in depression that is said uh, can antidepressants enhance function in euthymic brain or normal brain where where i oh i i cannot even see that okay yeah. can can antidepressants increase or enhance function in the normal brain uh, i don't know normal brain so that would be a very hard uh, question to answer whether there is any normal brain or not but yes if we give antidepressant to a so called normal brain which doesn't exist because normal brain what is normal brain i don't know what is normal brain is a question that is the hardest question i i have still faced and i i do not know the answer anyway in any person if we give antidepressant there would be increase in neuronal cellular metabolism there would be increase in neuronal excitation there would be increase in neuron uh, neuroimmune function there would be increase in stem cell proliferation so there would be more cognitive result would that be perceptible change that would be the bigger question in patients who are working at the peak of their uh, already functionality they would not feel any difference but patients who are overworked or who are not in that much top condition they would feel the difference so yes in normal patients they would also work okay uh again he asks do does schizophrenia do all patients of are all patients of schizophrenia autism spectrum in subtle or obvious ways uh, question comes what is autism spectrum all patients who develop so called schizophrenia has to have sensory processing disorder or sensory processing problem or sensory discrimination disorder the problem because without having them there is no possibility of having hallucination but having sensory pro discrimination or sensory processing problem without any obvious social deficit or without any obvious other deficit is very common so how would you make them fit into so called autism spectrum autism spectrum is a concept that fast bring confusion in the term if it is autism spectrum where does the spectrum merge with normalcy we don't know if it is autism spectrum where do we start labeling as pathology we don't know because we created this spectrum we are now dealing with neurotypicals and neurodivergent this type of idiotic things so standing there if we don't know normalcy how can we say that this patient is 
falling on autism spectrum or not but to have any form of hallucination it is imperative that the patient has sensory processing abnormality and sensory discrimination for abnormality okay uh, dr richa setia asks uh, what is the optimum treatment of negative symptoms i think we'll take it next time when we discuss next dose. this is yeah. next time next time because there is a top uh, series on uh, actually yeah. we are going to have a series of uh, see, sorry a, a topic on negative cognitive symptom yeah. the next topic would be negative and cognitive symptom yeah. then the next topic would be treatment case discussion and why, uh, treatment of uh, uh, negative symptom and discussions about negative symptom case presentation where we will talk about clozapine as well as we talk about negative symptom treatment and other things Okay. Bhaskar, if I might just bring to your notice, the third is case-based discussions on positive symptoms. Oh, the third topic. So, so then the after that, topic. yeah. Ah, so after when that. we when we take up the uh, discussions on negative symptoms separately, we yeah. address that. Yeah. Uh, Doctor Amit Sethi asks, cannabinoids can lead to psychosis or are useful to treat delusions? How do we go around that? Cannabinoids are a group of 500 uh, natural and I don't know how many synthetic are there at this moment. So, it is impossible to tell that how many are going to block the endocannabinoid system or change the brain excitation pattern and how many would enhance it. So, standing there, we, if I know and we all know about cannabidiol. Cannabidiol is more of a coming agent. Cannabidiol is a CBD is more of a agent which would be helpful in psychosis theoretically because at present I am not at liberty to use it practically. Okay. Uh, he also asks uh, what is the status of levamizole as an immune modulator? Still experimental and okay, nothing fine. Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Ankur Singhal asks, Which antidepressants do you defer, prefer in your patients? I don't prefer anything. Mm -hmm. Patients come with their symptom, patients come with their physical trait, patients come with their cognitive and various symptom trait, and based on that. Which antidepressant fits that? I prescribe that. I don't have any preference. No doctor should have any preference of any molecule. Um, okay. Uh, Dr. Jatin uh, Daman uh, has made a point. Uh, recently, Australia has started to prescribe psilocybin and MDMA for psychiatric disorders. How can that be explained with the receptors context? You want to comment on that right away, or do I uh, look like a person who care about receptor? No drug work via receptor. Forget your receptor. Drugs work via brain wide and body wide actions. First, think when you are thinking of a drug. Think whether that would excite a cell. Take a single cell. Imagine a single cell. And then do a cognitive experiment. Think whether that drug would excite the cell or inhibit the cell. Once you are done with this basic cognitive experiment, then make the single cell multifold. And connect the, uh, the multifold cells with each other. Some would have inhibitory control, some would have excitatory control, some would be inhibiting inhibitory control, some would be exciting excitatory control. Then, apply the same drug in these group of cells with the following caveats. Once you do that, you would come to understand how that drug would work in a multicellular organ. Then, go around thinking about whether that can help brain or not. So, standing there, psilocybin and MDMA 
are primarily drugs which would excite the brain cell which would excite the cells of immune system which would excite the autonomic nervous system so standing there they are drugs that would help in so called depression so called retarded depression so called drugs which would stop suicidal ideation they are euphoriant in very short way euphoriants are drugs which induces feeling of happiness but when they are stopped the euphoria is gone the euphoria is short lasting for 3 to 4 days maximum ideally the action is lost within 72 hours that is the definition of currently much debated definition of euphoriant is this so standing there we are talking about euphoriant euphoriant are for dysphoria that's all okay you so you use it to agree everywhere when you get dysphoria right so we'll take the last couple of questions uh, we are running a bit late so the last two questions and uh, answer them in the briefest possible uh, dr bhuvan roy asks uh, is there any evidence to demonstrate whether non medical uh, non medication approaches like cbt have any neuromodulatory inflammatory actions on or inflammation modulatory actions on the circuits that we talked about at the beginning yes dr roy there are evidences in 2014 no 2015 in 2015 there was a paper which was doing round which showed that it is imperative to have good frontal connectivity with other areas of brain to have the psychotherapy working so number 1 Psycho to for psychotherapy to work, it is needed that there should be a good frontal connectivity, and having good frontal connectivity means having good inflammatory ex pro inflammatory action in connections which are connecting frontal lobe to other areas of brain. That is one paper, two thousand four fifteen or two thousand fourteen. I forgot the time. then there are papers which showed that with <clears throat> cbt or any hope based therapy there is elevation of reward circuit activity now again that is normal because hope is the strongest natural motivator of approach arm of reward circuit reward circuit is motivated by two thing one is approach one is avoidance the approach arm is activated by hope the avoidance arm is activated by fear or misery so the approach arm activation is associated with cbt so yes there are evidences this reward circuit activation and other uh, part that came around 2017 you if you go, do a google search search you would find out so there are evidences okay now the last question is uh, by dr shubhangi parkar choice of antidepressant in post psychotic uh, depression anything would you suggest uh, post psychotic depression doesn't have it madam what happened is what it is depression is going on that the brain is functionally already restricted the more the brain goes into excess of cbt the more functional problem is there and ultimately once the severe excited of cbt or psychosis goes away and control it becomes apparent so for these patients ideally drugs which increase the prefrontal cortex activity more would be good for example so called drugs which have arousal properties right bupropion so called drugs which have <clears throat> excitatory properties like snris 
or fluoxetin or sertraline they can be good drugs okay and uh, there have been two requests first request was uh, whether i mean of course we make the presentations available on youtube in a couple of days but whether uh, you would like to uh, we would be willing to share your presentation with people who ask for that the powerpoint uh, and uh, powerpoint uh, actually when i am we are uploading the presentation we are already actually uploading the powerpoint because yeah but somebody has asked is... for it separately so that is one request and second hmm. request is uh, can you suggest any literature to un understand this concept so i think uh, you can take this up uh, on a personal uh, communication I with actually, dr I always chatin upload, i always upload the basic psychiatry folder in response to this comment because yeah. that has all the literatures okay so thank you bhaskar thank you for a nice uh, lucid presentation uh, lucid and in details and uh, thank you mm -hmm. for uh, answering we all the have, queries that have come up we are very very low attendance today why i don't know yeah we'll 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 uh, take it up with uh, mm -hmm. with the people so thank you so much and i hand over the proceedings to dr rajkumar sir thank you dr malay and dr bhaskar uh, friends we would like to have your feedbacks i have posted on the chat box the email address also kindly make it a point to give your feedbacks and if there are any questions that are still unanswered you can always post in that mailbox and we will ask the speakers to answer them at the earliest the next talk is going to be on the 14th of february and it's a case based discussion on positive symptoms so we eagerly look forward to the 14th of february till then good night from all of us here thank you very much good night bye bye bye